All right, again, as we begin chapter 6 this morning in Paul's letter to the uh, congregation that was in Rome, I just want to remind you of a few things that Paul has already talked about. Because remember, Paul's letters, they build on each other. The problem that we have is sometimes we want to jump into the middle of a letter and pull things out. And we oftentimes go into some crazy theological directions when we do that. But Paul has shared a lot of spiritual truth with, remember, this was primarily a Jewish congregation. How do we know that? Well, first of all, we think, who started this congregation? You know, Peter wasn't there, although they claimed that he eventually got to Rome. Paul certainly wasn't there at this time, but we do know from the book of Acts that there was a group of people that came from Rome, a group of Jewish people that came from Rome, then they were there on the day of Pentecost. They heard Peter preach that first message when the church began, they believed. They put their faith in Jesus Christ, and what did they do? They went back to Rome. And so there they were. So that's probably how this congregation got started. But they just heard the first message on the first day when the church began. There was a lot of information that they hadn't understood yet. And Paul's goal in this letter to that congregation was to get them up to speed. And so there's some very important things that Paul has has written to them. And by the way, these are important to us as well. He explained to this Jewish audience that they were helpless to change their spiritual reality. Remember, the Jewish people thought that because they were God's chosen people, that they were all right with God. Seems they forgot about their history as recorded in the Old Testament as far as that issue goes. But they just thought that they were okay just because of their heritage. There were some that probably believed that they were right with God because one, they were Jewish and they were God's chosen people. And in addition to that, they had the Mosaic Law. They just seemed to forget that the Mosaic Law didn't save them. The Mosaic Law never saved anyone. What the Mosaic Law did, which was very easy for it to do, was to condemn them. The Mosaic Law is good at doing that. 613 rules. And let me tell you something. If you start reading them, you will find one that condemns you as well. So Paul wanted them to understand that. Uh, It condemned them. And as he said earlier in the letter, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That was Jews and Gentiles both. But Paul added that Jesus died for their sin while they were still sinners and enemies of God. And all of them who put their faith in Jesus were declared right by God. That's the definition of justification. A declaration that you are now right with God. And through faith in Jesus Christ, that's what had happened for them. They were now right with God, justified. And since then, being justified, they were also reconciled with God. Paul reminded them that they had spiritual life now. They had resurrection life now. And then he talked about Abraham. Like Abraham, they were made right with God through faith. Remember, Abraham lived long before the law was even in existence, the Mosaic law. And yet, God said of Abraham in the, in the book of Genesis, Abraham believed God and it was credited or accounted to him as righteousness. So salvation is and always has been by faith, not works, not law. And they needed to understand that. And there's a lot of people that need to understand that today as well. They were totally forgiven by what Jesus did on the cross. And because he rose from the dead, they had spiritual life. So this led Paul to answer an anticipated question by his readers, and that's where we're picking up this morning. Uh, The fact is, is that some people were thinking, well, you know, maybe what we need to do is to continue in sin so that grace will increase. Shall we do that? Let's look at what verse 1 says. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? By the way, this is another therefore statement. The word translated then is often translated as therefore. So Paul had anticipated this question because of what he had just written to them. Now, you ask in your head, well, what did he just write? Well, let me show you. Romans 5 verse 20, Paul said this. The law came so that the transgression would increase. 
But where sin is increased, grace abounded all the more. So they read that, and Paul anticipates what they're going to say. Well, if that's the case, let's just go on sinning to make grace abound. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of people that still bring that question up today. This question still comes up all the time when you try to talk to somebody about God's grace and how they're totally forgiven. The sin issue has been taken care of on the cross. In your relationship with God, the sin issue has been taken care of. And then people will say things, oh, oh, so you believe that you have a license to sin. Let me just respond to that for just a second. You don't need a license to sin. You know why? You're already good at it. We're all good at it. Matter of fact, James said, we all stumble in many ways. There's not a person here this morning, myself included, that can say, I'm sinless. If you do that, we need to talk about the sin of lying. So we need to understand that. But people that say those things, they don't understand what grace actually teaches. That we are totally forgiven. That our sins, past, present, and future, were paid for on that cross. Even the ones we haven't committed yet, they're already paid for by the sacrifice on the cross. If they weren't paid for, then what Jesus did on that cross was insufficient. It didn't pay for the sin of the world. It didn't. And so people just don't understand what grace teaches. They don't understand what grace does. Paul is going to educate them on what grace actually does. We go on to verse 2. We need the answer. The question indicated that some of them did not understand what grace actually accomplished. And so that's where we're going to continue for there. Now we'll get on to verse 2. Paul writes, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin live in it? Now let me just say that phrase, may it never be, was the strongest Greek phrase that Paul could use that repudiated the statement and contained a sense of outrage that anyone would even think that that statement was possibly true. Paul couldn't have said in a stronger way, absolutely not. That's not what grace accomplishes. Grace doesn't do that. And that's what they didn't understand. So they're not understanding what grace is actually all about. Paul did not refer to the believers, and he's talking about uh, sin Paul is not talking about the believer's daily struggle with sin. But Paul in this verse here is talking about a one-time event that was completed in the past. Look at the verse. He says, how shall we who died to sin? That is past tense. That's not our struggle with daily sin. It's talking about an event that happened in the past. And by the way, that event is referring back to that moment that you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord. Because it was at that moment your sins are forgiven. It was at that moment you received eternal life. And so that's the moment that Paul is talking about. Died to sin. That's a fact of us, of our lives, spiritually speaking. All of us who are believers have already died to sin. That doesn't mean I don't sin every day. It's talking about that important event in the past when you got saved. So the believers were in Christ. Christ died in their place, as Paul talks about in Romans 5 verses 6 through 8. And they were counted dead with Jesus Christ. This, by the way, is the fundamental premise of this chapter. That we're dead in Christ and then risen with Christ as well. This is what happened with us the moment that we believed in Jesus Christ. So Paul's going to spend the remainder of this chapter explaining this concept and supporting it to make his point. Verse 3, he continues. Or do you not know? Paul likes to use that phrase when he's correcting someone. It's like, well, duh. Don't you know this already? You should know this. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized, oh, there's that word. 
Baptized. And when you use that word, there's all sorts of ideas that come up with the word baptism. We're going to get to that in just a second. Have been baptized into Christ Jesus. Have been baptized into His death. Now, the key to understand what Paul is saying in these verses lies in the meaning of that single word. Baptized. See, we have a problem with baptized. We have a problem with the concept of baptism. And we need to understand what Paul meant. And so, I have read numerous biblical commentaries on this passage of Scripture. I have yet to find one commentator that actually explains what the word baptize means from the Greek language. And we need to understand that because it's that important. Paul's reference to baptism was not a reference to a physical or a water baptism. You mention the word baptism to a Baptist, for instance, and they're talking about dunking them in the water. And sometimes churches and denominations, you know, they dunk them once. Sometimes they dunk them three times in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Now, every time I baptize someone, I always tell them ahead of time, I just want you to know one thing. I will always pull you up out of the water. Because if I don't, the next thing you're going to see is Jesus. And then I'm going to jail. So I always pull you back up. Especially like today if they're younger when they're getting baptized. But this is not talking about physical water baptism. And how do we know that? It's all wrapped up in the meaning of the word. You see, the word translated baptize came from the Greek word bapto which means or meant to immerse or to dip into something. It's used in a variety of different ways, but that's the basic meaning of the word. So the English words baptize, baptize, baptism, by the way, are not translations from the Greek. We say, well, what are they? They are actually called transliterations. What is a transliteration? A transliteration takes, in this case, Greek, bapto, and what they do, rather than give the meaning of the word immersed, they redefine it and they create a word that sounds and looks similar to the Greek word. So it's not a translation where they define what the word means in English. It is a created word in English that sort of looks like the Greek word. But it is not a translation. And by using a transliteration rather than a translation, the theologians can then define the word however they want. It's not a translation. And we need to understand that. And that's one of the reasons why we have so many different opinions in Christianity as to what baptism really is. But this is not talking about being dunked in a tank or in a river or a lake or a pool. It's not talking about anything that is physical at all. It is talking about a spiritual reality. So rather than saying believers were immersed into Christ Jesus, which, by the way, is the proper translation, the theologians could define baptize however they wanted. And that's one of the reasons that we have so much turmoil within Christianity over three words that are not translations, they are transliterations. So Paul said that all believers were what? Baptized into Jesus. What are all believers? What is the spiritual truth of every believer? We are immersed into Jesus Christ. And you know, there's also the spiritual reality. Not only are we in Him, He is in us. We are united with Jesus Christ. We are in union with Jesus Christ. And this describes their and our spiritual relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what it means. Immersed into Jesus Christ. And that relationship also, as Paul said, they were immersed into his death. This is very, very important. This spiritual reality is vitally important to what Paul is talking about in these verses and the truth of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Since a believer was immersed into Jesus Christ and were immersed into his death, 
That meant, spiritually speaking, they died in Christ and His death actually paid their sin debt. Because spiritually speaking, when Christ is on the cross dying for the sin of the world and we are spiritually in Christ... We're dying spiritually as well. Our sin debt is being paid for by what he's doing because we're now in Christ. Therefore, our sin is paid by his sacrifice because spiritually we were in Christ in his death. The good news is it's not just in his death. It's also in his life. Because that was what Paul talks about as well. So he died for sin and they died for sin in him. And we died for sin in him. So our sin literally has been forgiven by what Jesus did. Water baptism cannot produce the spiritual reality that happens when a person believes in Jesus as Lord. There's no physical act that you could do, whether it's water baptism, whether it's taking the Lord's Supper or communion. It does not give you a relationship with Jesus Christ. It does not pay for your sins. It does not give you life. Faith in Jesus Christ is what does that for us. We put our faith in Jesus Christ, our sins are paid for. We put our faith in Jesus Christ, we have His resurrection life. The resurrection isn't just a physical event in the future. It is a spiritual reality to everyone who has confessed Jesus as Lord. And this is what Paul is talking about. This was a spiritual reality that Paul wanted his readers to understand because this was because there was a spiritual result from this spiritual reality. And this is how he's going to answer, shall we sin so that grace may abound? He's wanting them to know, now right now, where you are is in Christ. You died with Him. You rose with Him. You are not the same person, spiritually speaking. And there's a result that comes from that. Verse 4. Therefore, he just shared these important truths. Therefore, we have been buried with him through immersion, immersed into Christ, into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too, so we too might walk in newness of life. That's the way, that's the reality that he is talking about. So what is Paul doing here? He is now going to explain the result of what he has just taught them. So, they were immersed into his death, which meant as Christ was raised from the death, from the dead, they were to walk in newness of life. You know what? You were in Christ on the cross, spiritually speaking. But in addition to that, he rose from the dead and has life. So if you're in Christ and he rose from the dead, then you know what? You should be walking in newness of life. You should just be reflecting the reality of what's inside. And what's inside is different after you have believed in Jesus Christ. Of course, raised from the dead is also a reference to the coming resurrection as well. But we got to see this. Buried with him through immersion into death meant that the sin debt was Paid for you as a person when you believed in Jesus Christ. Raised from the dead to walk in newness of life meant each believer possessed what? Christ's life, which is resurrection life. Now, I don't look like I have a resurrected body. If this is the body I have for all eternity, I feel like I got gypped. Because there's a lot of things wrong. I can tell you about all the tests I just went through in the last two weeks. About what's wrong with my body, you know. But I don't want this body for eternity. Yes, there is coming a physical resurrection. There is a glorified body that we're all going to have. But the reality is right now, since Christ is in us and we are in Christ. And He has resurrection life. He is life. We have spiritual life right now. And that's what we ought to be reflecting. That is the reality. And the thing is, is that the newness of life also referred to the fact that the believer was now what? 
What does Paul say in 2 Corinthians? A new creation in Christ. This is actually what Paul said. He said, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that's a believer. He is what? A new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. That's speaking of a spiritual reality that you are a new person in Christ. And that old person that you were spiritually is dead. Nailed to the cross. So then Paul repeated the reality of faith in Christ. Verse 5, he continues. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. This is just talking about a spiritual reality. If a person became united with him in the likeness of his death, how does that happen? By faith. The new resurrection life was a present spiritual reality because they were in Christ and Christ was in them. But in addition to that, it is a future physical promise of that resurrection body that's coming because our body, our resurrection body, is going to be like His resurrection body. No defects. I won't have to shave my head anymore. Because when I first came to this church, as Gary said of me, you know, you can't trust a guy with, what was it, dark, luscious, long, luscious hair. And now Gary can trust me. But when I get there, I'm going to have the long, luscious hair again. Because there's not going to be any defects in the body. And that's the spiritual reality that is coming. The physical reality that is coming. He continues in verses 6 and 7. Knowing this. He's like, you got that? Well, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. In other words, prior to this, we were slaves to sin. After this, we're not slaves to sin. For he who has died is Freed from sin. Freed from the penalty of sin. Freed from the power of sin. So once they put their faith in Christ, the old self was crucified with Jesus. It's a spiritual thing that takes place. They no longer had an old self. You know what is amazing about crucifixion? Everyone that was crucified died. If you were crucified, you didn't come down from that cross until you were dead. And there were times as the two that were crucified with Jesus, he was already dead. In order to hasten their death, they broke their legs. If you know anything about crucifixion, you know that will quickly put an end to someone's life on the cross. If you're crucified, you're dead. That old self like anyone who was crucified, did not survive the crucifixion. And by the way, we don't have two natures. We have one nature. We have one nature which is a new nature. A new creation. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.17, the old is dead. The old is gone. Crucified on that cross. The sin nature was crucified when someone puts their faith in Jesus Christ. And since believers were crucified with Jesus, they're no longer, you and I, are no longer slaves to sin. You know what? We can't ever say, I'm going to date myself now. We can never say like Flip Wilson used to say, See if the old people in here know. Remember Flip Wilson? The devil made me do it. No, 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 no. The devil can't make you do anything. Because you have been freed from sin. Uh, this is why continuing in sin makes no sense. Because we've been freed from sin. It just doesn't work for us anymore. You know, as Christians, you can sin if you want. But you know what's going to happen? You're going to be miserable. Why? 
Because if you continue in sin, there's things that are going to be missing in your life like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, faithfulness and self-control. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. If you're walking in sin, you're not going to experience the fruit of the Spirit. So you wonder why that person's so grumpy when they're walking in sin. Because the fruit of the Spirit is not there. You will be miserable. And that also would be evidence that you genuinely were saved because you are miserable. That's an indication. Again, this does not mean that they were sinless. We still have attitudes and actions. Think of it this way. A freed slave can choose to do what the old master says, but they don't have to. But sometimes what we do is we listen to the old master. And we give in to the sin. Now he says, he who has died is freed from sin. I want you to think about it this way. To grasp this concept and how it works. Okay, you're driving down the road. You're going 60 miles an hour. You just passed that speed limit sign that said 25. All of a sudden you look in your rear view mirror and you see those red flashing lights. And you pull over. And you pull over, you know, license and registration, and this cop is talking to you, and he's getting ready to write you this ticket that's going to be way expensive. And you're thinking about that ticket, and as you're sitting in the seat, you go, oh, 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 oh. and you have a heart attack, and right then and there, you die. You know what the police officer is not going to do? He's not going to finish writing that ticket and pin it on your shirt. He's not going to look at you and say, see in court. When the court date comes around, they're not going to send to the morgue and bring your body into the courtroom and say, do you realize the charges that are against you? You don't care because you're dead. You know what? The law doesn't have power over you when you're dead. Sin doesn't have power over you when you are dead. You are freed from the penalty of sin when you're dead. And guess what? We, spiritually speaking, died in Christ on the cross. So we are now dead to sin... It has no power over us. It cannot make us do anything. We have to decide to do that. But we have been freed from that sin. It's not going to say to us, see you in court. So Paul is now going to continue. We have a few more verses we're going to look at this morning. By explaining why believers should not sin so that grace may abound. He continues, the whole topic is, hey, death's not your master anymore. Verse 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. Okay, so Paul reminded his readers, through faith they spiritually died with Christ, and since they were in Christ and He rose from the dead, they would also, as he says here, live with Him. That's present spiritual reality right now, but it's also physical reality in the resurrection that is coming. They were spiritually alive with Christ, and again, because of that, they actually would rise from the dead in the resurrection. Verse 9. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. So we look at this and we see Christ obviously rose from the dead. And he overpowered death. And it had no power over him. And he was never going to die again. There was only one sacrifice of Jesus. That was on the cross. As the writers of Hebrew, a writer of Hebrews said, he stands, or rather, he sits at the right hand of, the God, of God in heaven. The high priest never sat as he was offering sacrifices in the temple because his job was never done. Jesus died on that cross, paid the sin debt, and he sat down, mission accomplished. And so that's a reality. Verse 10, he continues. For the death that he died, he died to sin, how often? Once for all. 
But the life that he lives, he lives to God. So again, Jesus died once, only once, and his death was good for all who put their faith in him. But in addition to that, he now lives to glorify God. And guess what? He lives to glorify God through us. As we reflect Christ, as the Spirit produces His fruit through us, where's the glory going? To God. It's going to God. And that's part of what is supposed to happen. That's why we can't sin so that grace may abound. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't agree with our new nature. Can we sin? Absolutely. We still have the flesh. We still have sin that resides within us. And Paul will get to that later on in this letter. But that's not what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be reflecting Jesus Christ. And so in verse 11 he says, Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to to God in Christ Jesus. So this is something that we have to realize. This is something that we have to acknowledge. And when temptation comes, and it will, we have to respond to that by saying, you know what? I'm dead to that. The flesh does not have power over me. Sin does not have power over me because I am in Christ and Christ is in me. I can say no. I can change my focus. I can walk away from it. And in some cases, Paul says, run away from it. Get away. We have that option. But we have to consider it. We have to think about it because it doesn't come automatically. Jesus isn't going to make you choose a better path. He wants you to choose the better path. So Christ died to sin and was alive for the glory of God. Therefore, believers were to do what? They were to do the same. Consider yourself since they were in Christ. And rather than sinning so grace would increase, believers were to recognize that they were dead to sin and alive to Christ. That's a difference in attitude and motivation as to why we just don't continue and go crazy in sin. So this was no license to sin. But what Paul has explained to this Roman congregation was that there is a spiritual reality of what happened to them spiritually when they confessed Christ. And there's a spiritual reality of who they are now in Christ. So there's a spiritual reality. And this ought to be the motivation to do what? Glorify God rather than give in to sin. This is never a license to sin. Paul anticipated their question. And he anticipated the question of many people today. And he says... That's not the way that we're supposed to live because we are new creations in Jesus Christ. So live who we actually are.